Ja, hello, mein Name ist Esther Slevogt von Nachtkritik.de. Herzlich willkommen bei Theater und Netz, Woll 3. Wir haben diese Konferenz vor drei Jahren erfunden, weil uns schien, dass das Theater, welches man mit guten Gründen als das älteste Medium der Welt bezeichnen könnte, eine nahezu selbstmörderische Ignoranz den Veränderungen an den Tag legte, die von den neuen Medien und der digitalen Revolution verursacht sind. Macht mal den Computer aus und kommt wieder ins Theater, das schien lange die verbreitete Haltung. Eine Haltung, die allerdings verkannte, dass die Leute ihren Computer nicht wieder ausmachen würden, sondern höchstens nicht mehr ins Theater kommen würden. Und in der Zwischenzeit hatte außerdem das Internet längst begonnen, nicht nur das Publikum, sondern auch die darstellende Kunst selber, also das Theater zu verändern und neu zu formatieren. Mit dieser Konferenz wollten wir ein Forum schaffen, diese Veränderungen samt aller Fragen, die sich daraus ergeben, wahrzunehmen, erst einmal überhaupt, und zu diskutieren und sich ganz praktisch dann auch über den Umgang mit den neuen Kulturnetz, äh, Kulturtechniken des Netzes informieren zu können. In diesem Jahr findet die Konferenz nun zum dritten Mal statt. Es gibt so viele Teilnehmer wie nie zuvor. Ich, wir freuen uns sehr, dass Sie da sind. Mit dem tollen Satz, Schatten werfen nun Körper, hat Karl Kraus schon vor 100 Jahren hellsichtig den essentiellen Paradigmenwechsel beschrieben, den die Virtualisierung der Wirklichkeit durch die Medien ausgelöst hat. Karl Kraus, der schon am Beginn des 20. Jahrhunderts ein seismografischer Beobachter und Beschreiber des medialen Wandels und dem von diesem Wandel ausgelösten substanziellen Veränderung an der Substanz von Sprache, Kultur und Politik und Gesellschaft gewesen ist. Schatten, die Körper werfen. Damit sind wir aber auch beim ureigensten Geschäft des Theaters angelangt und beim Anliegen dieser Konferenz. In den nächsten Tagen, in den beiden Tagen, wird es nämlich darum gehen, die Körper zu beschreiben, die von den Schatten der Digitalisierung ins Theater geworfen werden, wo sie sich unter anderem in, Struktur, Erzähl, in Strukturen, Erzähl- und Spielweisen, Ästhetiken und so fort physisch materialisieren. Einige dieser Schatten auf den Ebenen Technik, Ästhetik und Politik punktuell dingfest zu machen, dingfest, ein schönes analoges und subversives Wort übrigens, wie ich finde, das haben wir uns für die dritte Ausgabe der Konferenz Theater und Netz vorgenommen. Und nun ergebe, für die weiteren Infos übergebe ich an Christian Römer, Referent für Kultur und neue Medien bei unserem Partner, der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung, der ich an diesem Punkt hier auch mal für die Zusammenarbeit danken möchte. Ja, Christian, the stage is yours. Ja, vielen Dank, Esther. Herzlich willkommen auch vom Gastgeber hier in der Stiftung. Ich möchte erst mal ganz kurz fragen, wer ist zum ersten Mal hier bei Theater und Netz? Oh my God. Okay. Wer ist zum zweiten Mal hier? Okay. Und wer ist zum dritten Mal hier? Aha. Und ich glaube, ich glaub, das, beschreibt, das beschreibt eigentlich in seiner Interaktivität ganz gut, was so einfach in den letzten drei Jahren oder zwei Jahren passiert ist mit dieser Konferenz. Das hat einfach richtig Fahrt aufgenommen. Esther hat es gesagt, von der ersten bis zur dritten Konferenz, langer Weg. Äh, traditionell widmen wir uns am ersten Tag immer der Fortbildung und den Workshops. Ja, das war uns ein ganz wichtiges Anliegen am Anfang, dass wir ganz besonders für diejenigen, die in den Theatern, im Marketing arbeiten, in der Öffentlichkeitsarbeit, ja, dass wir da Workshop-Angebote machen, weil das oft ein Bereich ist, der ein bisschen alleingelassen ist im großen Fortbildungsangebot. Äh, ja. Und wir wissen ja, dass die Kolleginnen und Kollegen alle einen ähm, Künstlervertrag haben, NV Solo. Äh, aber nichtsdestotrotz, äh, ich sag mal, ist das auch manchmal instrumentell zu verstehen. Aber ihr seid die Avantgarde des Netzes in den Theatern. Ähm, Wissenstransfer und Erfahrungsaustausch äh, stehen im Zentrum dieses Tages. Und inzwischen gibt es in den deutschen Theatern immer mehr Experten für den Einsatz von Social Media, Internet als Vermittler zwischen Theater und Publikum. Die Expertise bei unserer Konferenz kam am Anfang von außen. Junge Berliner Social Media Agenturen, Firmenberater, Netzphilosophen berichten aus ihren Welten und wir diskutierten gemeinsame Wirkungen von Netzphänomenen auf und in die Theater. Zwei Jahre später haben wir viele praktizierende netzaffine Theaterprofis im Publikum und vor allem auch unter den Sprecherinnen und Sprechern. 
die freundlicherweise unserer Einladung gefolgt sind. Und Sie werden Ihre Expertise und Ihre praktischen Erfahrungen mit uns teilen. Dafür Ihnen allen herzlichen Dank. Der Ansturm ist überwältigend. Wir danken unserem Partner nachkritik.de, insbesondere Esther Slevogt und Christian Rako. Und ich danke sehr dem agilen Ulf Schmidt. Wir vier haben, ich sag mal, ein paar Monate uns jeden Dienstag getroffen und dann uns all diese Dinge ausgedacht. Dafür für die gemeinsame Arbeit ganz herzlichen Dank. Natürlich allen Mitarbeiterinnen von Technik, Stage Management, Service und allen anderen. Heute bei unserer Überfüllung fast keine leichte Aufgabe. Herzlichen Dank. Ganz kurz bevor es losgeht mit dem eigentlichen Programm ein paar praktische Dinge. Sie werden es gemerkt haben, wir haben offenes WLAN im Haus, Freifunk natürlich, ohne Passwort zugänglich für Ihre Endgeräte. Äh, Twitterball wird immer wieder draußen an, der, an unserer großen Wand gezeigt werden. Das heißt, Sie sehen auch nicht nur am Endgerät, sondern auch da draußen, was hier getwittert wird. Steckdosen haben wir im ganzen Haus verteilt. Und obwohl wir so viele sind, kriegen wir das gemeinsam hin. Am Ende dieser ersten Stunde werden wir hier im Plenum die Räume und die Workshopleiter der ersten Runde vorstellen und bitten Sie einfach, kurz im Plenum zu bleiben, denn dann haben wir gemeinsam einen fließenden Übergang, denn uns ist wichtig, dass Sie alle genau in die Workshops kommen, die Sie belegt haben. Und wenn da vielleicht ein Stuhl fehlt, wir sind sofort da, aber ich würde Sie bitten, dass wir genau diesen Übergang gemeinsam machen, damit Sie einfach genau das von der Konferenz haben, was Sie sich gewünscht haben. Wir achten so auf pünktliche Einhaltung Anfangs- und Endzeiten, einfach damit wir nach hinten raus in der Solidarität zu denen, die danach kommen, auch wirklich pünktlich sind, ist uns wichtig. Ja, und wenn Sie noch Fragen haben, hilft Ihnen gerne unser Team. I'll switch to English now, as we soon approach the main act of this Berlin morning hour. We decided very early to ask for an opening speech by a scholar, somebody who is able to expand our view of the political implications of change and action in regard to three key issues. Infrastructure, especially agents, and the measurement of change. This blends in perfectly into our main question of player and platform, how can the theater be political? And if it decides to be a player, which game can it play? By pointing towards ideas and possibilities of change in the age of the digital, we will experience a wider view of those matters in question. And now, it is my immense pleasure to introduce to you our first guest, currently, He's teaching at the Institute for Culture and Aesthetic of Digital Media at Leuphana University in Lüneburg. He's the co-founder of the famous Center for Internet Security in Bangalore, India. He researches and teaches on questions of openness, identity, gender and sexuality, and humanities mediated by digital technologies and online cultures. His lecture style today will be a 20-minute lecture. Then he will take questions in order to expand on his research, and you are invited to prepare those questions already while listening, so you are also responsible for the second part of this lecture. Um, well, what's left to say? I had the amazing pleasure to witness uh, Nishan's talks on the selfie at Steirischer Herbst last year, and his keynote about the public commons in India at Transmediale. Nishan Shah has defined that spectacle imperative in his monograph, Whose Change Is It Anyway? Whose Change Is It Anyway? Today, he has put the title somewhat on a political edge, Beyond the Spectacle Imperative, Performing Change in the Age of the Digital. The floor is yours. Right. Oh, good afternoon, and and thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's always um, it's always so strange when other people introduce you because half the things sound like, "Did I do that?" Um, <laughs> right. Um, but I'll, I'll try to live up to some of the expectations. But thank you very much for letting me share some of my thoughts with you. Uh, when I first had the conversation with Christian, I told him, saying, "I have made it a point that I never want to present things which I have already published because they are closed conversations." Uh, and so a lot of the things that I'm producing right now are thoughts in progress. I apologize if they are not always well-rounded, uh, but I hope that the rawness of it will actually help us start different kinds of conversations. Um, so when Christian first wrote to me with this invitation, I know that it was a tough call. 
and not because the connections have not been made between performing arts and digital technologies, right? Uh, but because these connections suffer from what I call a particular blind spot that could be defined as the spectacle imperative. The spectacle imperative is perhaps best understood within digital spaces by thinking about cultures of witnessing and testimony. So if we look at the quasi-philosophical joke on the social web, where if a tree falls in loneliness and there is nobody to tweet of it, did it really fall? Facetious as it might sound, there is a way by which we are living in a world of looking, right? And right now I'm looking at myself on that huge screen over there and that's really uncanny. Um, but from the ubiquitous cameras on our cell phones to the drones flying in the sky, from surveillance systems uh, monitoring our information flow to the satellites spying on our bedroom windows, there is a culture of watching and being watched that surrounds us. And this surplus data um, which needs to be watched and the proliferation of watchers who watch us has transformed our lives into spectacles, tiny snatches of decontextualized performances which can be stitched together like any peer-to-peer -peer BitTorrent network would do into larger narratives which are held together roughly by algorithms of distribution, storage, and curation. I wanted to talk about the spectacle imperative and what it embodies by going at a very, very personal level. I want to begin by talking about my grandmother. This is not her. Um, but my grandmother is 84 years old. And recently, when I was visiting her, she asked me what a selfie is. I took out my phone, and after a brief discussion, my grandmother finally took her first selfie. Uh, we saw it together on the screen, and she asked me to delete it. I didn't know why she wanted to do that, because I think she looks fabulous. Uh, she considered my question for a while, and then she says, you can tell that I'm not wearing my favorite perfume when you look at this picture. <laughs> for a brief second, I could not compute what she was saying, right? She said, you can tell I'm not wearing my favorite perfume. And I asked her to kind of explain, saying, what do you mean? And then she went into her cupboard, and she brought out this album, um, which has four photographs of her. Because in the first 55 years of her life, as my grandmother lived through the Indian independence movement, different forms of liberalization, globalization, and so on, there were nine pictures of her which were ever taken. Out of that, um, only about four survive now. And each photograph was not only a story about a special event in her life, but it was also the story of how the picture was taken. It required a whole regime of getting up early, cleaning and bathing, wearing her best clothes and jewelry, going to the temple to get blessings, packing a vanity case and going to the photographer's studio, applying makeup, rehearsing for the pose, and then for the final shot, taking out the very rare and expensive perfume which would have come from England, dabbing it behind her ears, and then looking into the lens to get that moment frozen in time. Two days later, the picture would arrive, processed, and then it was laminated and put into a frame and hung in the house as a sign of defiant vanity and modernity. So of those four pictures that now remain, um, carefully preserved in a photo album, covered in a transparent tissue, handled with care, bearing testimonies to years of living and transformation, which cannot be reduced to a spectacle, every time my grandmother shows us a picture, she tells a story about it. And there are many stories that emerge. Sometimes the stories are contradictory. Sometimes they are factual. Sometimes they are about the processes. Sometimes it's about the people who are not in the pictures. Sometimes it's about people who have died and things that have happened. They are all different kinds of stories that tell me about colonization, independence, running a family, being a woman, social organization, political participation, etc. These stories are wonderful oral histories and memories of things real, imagined, and experienced. They talk about the crises that have been forgotten, they tell of relationships and ecologies that made survival possible. They speak about the infrastructure of life and resources needed to make change. And they talk about networks of love, of affection, of belonging, then how they help us live through contemporary times. For my grandmother, the legibility of life, its intelligibility or its accessibility, and meanings are not contained within visual frames of reference, but within affective ones. Earlier last year, uh, she got a new digital camera. And after playing around with it for some time, she now has a 1,000 pictures of her past, which never existed. Because over the last eight months, she has got together with her sisters, her daughters, and granddaughters to recreate moments from her personal history 
which has no photographic or material presence outside of her own memory of these events. And in the process, she now has about 1,000 pictures of things which never happened or might have happened or could have happened, or maybe she wished they would have happened, to create spectacles of things that were never there. On the other end of the spectrum, I have a godson who is four years old. My friend who is a doting mother and naturally thinks that her baby is the best thing that has happened to the world, started a website to share details about her son when she was four months pregnant. The first picture of my godson is a sonogram from the doctor's office in which he was still a 12-week fetus. Since then, there are about a thousand pictures of him on the website, uploaded by his parents and his family members. He's so used to having pictures taken of him that he never poses in the presence of a camera. Or rather, as his father says, he lives his life posing, always aware that at some point, somebody might be watching him and taking pictures of him. These two very personal stories for me cover a huge spectrum of spectacles in the day of the digital, and they remain interesting because they cannot easily be accommodated or understood in the contemporary discourse around cultural production and digital technologies. If we look at the larger impulses of how the conversations are taking shape, the points of convergence for cultural production and maybe hopefully also theater and the internet are around the questions of infrastructure, of historicization and preservation, of production and of distribution. These questions concentrate on how the internet can serve as either a catalyst for new theatrical practices or a tool to build infrastructure and reach out to new audiences. Or if we flip it the other way around, the questions ask whether we can um, use the internet as a space for cultural performance or whether the digital is the best medium to share the changing uh, liveness and the performative practices of theater. While generative and fruitful, questioning the uh, changing forms, formats, and functions of digital and cultural practices, these questions are unable to account for me, both my grandmother and my grandson, as shaping the realm of political intentions, social activism, and cultural production in the time of the digital. Because in all these questions, the idea of who is an actor, what privileges are afforded to those who can act, and the normative structures of bodies that can be invoked to act remain either unquestioned or invisible. And hence, today, to talk about performing change in the digital age, I'm kind of going to ask us to shift the focus a little bit and concentrate not on how to bring about change or how to engineer and sustain it, because I think you have more collective experience which is way richer than anything I can actually offer in terms of suggestions. And instead, I want to look at the history of the change actor, right? the person who was able to produce change, to become a participant in different kinds of social and political processes uh, through cultural production. And perhaps want to look at a more complicated picture which talks about not how to change, but who can change. And I want to talk about the who can change, especially in the flattened, networked reality that the digital turn introduces to us by looking at three different historical and geographical contexts of the internet. And I want to begin um, the story of the internet in 1835 in India. Thomas Babington Macaulay, whose name can possibly only be explained by the fact that his parents did not love him very much, um, wrote a document titled The Minutes on Education in which he argued that a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. For Macaulay, the native heathen was marked as a subject who has a past, but no history, and hence needs to be educated in English to become the middleware for smooth administration of the erstwhile British Empire. Macaulay's bastards, as they are derisively called in India, became the first instance of a modern spectator actor that was produced by the bastardized technocracy of colonized covenants, uniting with the codes and codexes of knowledge making. It draws to our attention that the actor or the spectator has a much closer relationship with the politics of governance and exclusion than with the processes of literacy, interpretation, and inclusion. Because once Macaulay was able to argue successfully that what the Indian really needed uh, was actually to start looking at uh, the great literates from England, you would have thought that he would just import a massive amount of literature from England and get it into India. But instead of doing that, what he does is that he creates two different forms by which 
an Indian native is going to become a social participant and an actor of change. The two forms that he introduces are that of the accounting ledger and the Indian penal code. In this video loop collective by Rux Media in New Delhi, it's called an unfrozen archival afternoon unregistered on the Richter scale. It shows us surveyors, the ledger keepers, the accountants who are keeping count of the wealth and resources of the British East India Company. The accounting system was not only meant to codify the domination of the British Empire, but also to get the heathen counted. The picture of surveyors in Bengal reminds us that the most dominant form of participation was in counting and in being counted. The infrastructural trace of information uh, that balances on both sides to maintain a state of equ equilibrium. And anybody who's ever looked at code or made databases or performed networks will realize how much we count and how much it is about the symmetry of that which can be counted and those who need to do the counting. The ledger serves even today as a metaphor to understand database governances, quota-based affirmative action, and it makes us intelligible and produces us as legible as those who could count and be counted. What is also present in this visual is Macaulay's commitment to train the Indian native to become a pakka sahib, um, a true honorable British man. And in the interest of this transformation, Macaulay produced the Indian penal code that obsessively sought to regulate the orgiastic practices of the native. Right? He formulated something called the Unnatural Sexual Acts Law, which criminalized all sexual acts except for those penal vaginal intercourses that were intended for procreation. Uh, this means holding hands and kissing uh, as unnatural sexual acts. Right? So if you ever looked at Bollywood from earlier times and you figured out why the actor and the actress come close together and then they never kiss, well, it's because the unnatural sexual act said that kissing was unnatural. So right, from 1835 onwards, this has continued across the Indian culture. Um, but one of the things that uh, the unnatural sexual acts did was that it introduced a series of guidelines on how to curb the homoerotic excesses of the Indian native one of which was to create boundaries in closed spaces, not allowing for the unclean male bodies to touch each other, thus succumbing to the temptation of the flesh. These boundaries became the blueprint of how much space must be maintained between two men in a close working environment so that they can concentrate on their work, restrain their libidinal desires, and resist the urge to break into song, dance, and sodomy. The image loop, as it moves from light to dark, illustrates the possibility of a homoerotic camaraderie that Macaulay imagined in the unsupervised offices of the British Empire. Because it was only once the native was taught to count and be counted, to compute and be computed, and once the native was trained to understand the penal implications of his penile desires, that the native could understand the true value and uh, power of poetry that invited him to wander lonely as a cloud and chance upon a host of daffodils. That in order for the native to become an actor or a part of an audience capable of the acts of reading and interpretation, a massive infrastructure of accounting and policing had to come into being. This is what I call the dark side of infrastructure. We delude ourselves if we insist that the infrastructure either for the cultural space of theater or the diffuse space of the internet is not only subject to policing, but also polices the boundaries of the normative and the desired. That in order to think of these two spaces as transgressive, as, as provocative, as pushing for change, is going to face massive resistance from different powers that wield control and regulate uh, who, gets to, uh, who gets to be active and who gets to be activated in the network societies that we live in. The second kind of an actor that I want to invoke in our conversations about change making is that of a pervert. When we think of a change agent, right, all these people who are going to march down the streets and topple autocracy and fight bureaucracy and so on, in the hallowed halls of theater or in the digital pathways of the internet, there is a certain gentrification of politics that appears. The agent of change in the digital turn is always somebody who's on the right side of the left with ethical impulses, motivated by the desire to do good and fighting for the rights of the common man. But when we turn to the digital, it's obvious that the stories get blurred sometimes. And let me illustrate this through the tale of possibly the most scandalous public archive and the fight for free speech and expression in India. This is the story of Savita Bhabi. 
Savita Bhabi is the, or Bhabi is the Hindi word for sister-in-law, by the way, and is used as an affectionate term of endearment for even those who are not related by marriage. Right? So Savita Bhabi became an iconic cartoon figure in, erupting on the Indian internet in the March of 2008. Um, the website features the first adult comic strip series, which depicted the life of an Indian housewife who had fantasy-filled and fantastic adulterous experiences with different men in the absence of a husband who was always traveling or working. In many ways, the Savita Bhabi comic strip follows the standard trope of adult um, fantasy encounters that one might have found in pornographic letters in adult entertainment magazines like Playboy and Penthouse, uh, or indeed in the pulp fiction that's available in the side streets of a pirated bookshop in India. What was startlingly new about this comic strip was the setting of the Indian family and the tropes of transgression that the central married female character embodies. Across the 51 stories published under this moniker, the comic strip uses the site of the home and the family as a space of sexual promiscuity and encounters of fantasy. The emergence of an Indian body in Indian settings in circumstances that seemed more real than the clandestine pornography that we import from America and Europe made the comic strip an overnight viral phenomenon. For over a year, Savita Bhavi became the new face of Indian porn, where bodies like ours were suddenly installed as actors in fantasy, rather than mere consumers of it. In 2008, it became the 82nd most visited Indian site. It received many accolades from the national media for representing a new sexually empowered, unapologetic female protagonist who embodied the liberating sexual mores of a largely conservative country. In 2009, however, the sexual adventures of Savita Bhabi were called to an abrupt halt when the Department of Telecommunications at the Ministry of Communications and Information Technologies issued an order asking all internet service providers to block access to the website. Under the law, the owners of the website could have the chance to appeal the ban, but that would have required for a few people to come out and say, we are the people who have been writing this porn. Uh, eventually, after lots of public pressure, when there was so much concern about the internet being gagged, free speech being um, stifled, Puneet Agarwal, who is a second generation Indian in London, took responsibility for the website and started something called the Save Our Savita Bhabi campaign, uh, very much on a website like Kickstarter, uh, to muster public interest and support for the removal of the ban. However, the campaign lost its teeth because his mother was very angry with him for taking claim of this particular comic strip. <laughs> and it looked like the adventures of Savita Bhabi were to end. And indeed, all digital traces of her had to be removed, and she had to be forgotten. And yet, as soon as the death, digital death was announced, multiple archives of the entire collection of Savita Bhabi's comic strips emerged online. Savita Bhabi got presented in different formats and was shared on peer-to-peer -peer torrent networks. She was animated and preserved in videos that documented the comic strips. The strips were narrativized and shared. Memes around Savita Bhabi became popular, using both her name and her form as a part of the social exchange on the social web. In fact, the shutting down of the website made sure that all the internet pornographers suddenly became internet archivists and activists. In times when digital storage is almost infinite and copying from the web is easy, it turned out that multiple offline archives of Savita Bhavi comic strips were lurking on the dark web and were suddenly made available to be shared. Even as the law shut down the website and the original creators were unable to fight the social and cultural conservatism of the right-wing parties, the pervert who was consuming these adult fantasies suddenly became an activist animating a blocked website and using the distributed and connected form of the internet to create a massive global homage to the first Indian pornographic figure. The story of Savita Bhavi and the figure of the perverted archivist storing data and restoring it when it appears is the story both of degeneration of archives but also of the libidinal excesses that animate our affective and personal investment in the interventions we make that social and political agents who are often presented to us as mechanical nodes in a, ne in a network just waiting to be activated by information flow needs to be rethought completely differently. Because the change agents act by the perverse and the libidinal investment that they have in the material that they are interested in. 
Their activities are in the dark web, not archived, not visible, but lurking and still present, available in the face of crisis to be virally activated. The pervert archivists who now continue to defy legal, social, and cultural censors and support uh, Savita Bhabi bear testimonies to the past and present an unusual line of defense for free speech activism in India. In most of our imaginations of change actors, uh, we basically have this idea that the actor is diverse, right? And we talk a lot about the need, how the internet's going to bring diverse audiences and different kinds of people to come and engage with our work. And I wanted to kind of add this one last story from another history of the internet, which actually comes from cybernetics and the first order of cybernetics to think about a stalker dolphin, right? This is the story of a dolphin who turned into a stalker. Um, in the 1950s, John C. Lilly was already spending precious research budgets on having a woman named Margaret live with a bottlenose dolphin called Peter in an attempt to break the interspecies communications barrier. Uh, he basically fooled NASA and told them that one day if we meet extraterrestrial life, we are going to find a new way of engaging with them. Right? This is the most bizarre kind of an audience you can ever imagine. And the best way of doing it would be for the human and the dolphins to talk to each other. And so he goes on to the US Virgin Islands and builds this incredible thing called the Dolphinarium which is a house that is part land and part water, flooded with about six feet of water. And Margaret Howe, who you see in that picture, who lives for six weeks with Peter, uh, basically is asked to train and know Peter in extraordinary ways to teach him how to understand human language. Um, and while it began really interestingly and simply, something strange started happening at the turn of week four. Peter started having erotic desires for Margaret. So that every time they were together, he would be excited, he would constantly push at her feet, he would gnaw at her, at her toes, he would bruise her, he would want to exercise his desires upon her. And even though he had two other female dolphins which were provided to him for relief, uh, he, was, he, he, he refused to kind of engage with them, right? So he started talking, Mark, stalking Margaret. And Margaret at that point, decided that the best way for the experiment to continue was for her to take matters in her own hands, which she did. And so you have the production of the most dubious research methodology ever, where she became the woman who slept with a dolphin. Yeah? Uh, and, and, while, and, while, and, and, and this produces the first order of a cybernetic unit which is to that we need to start imagining our change actors not merely as people that we already know, people that we can already imagine, or people who have access, affordability, connectivity, and can click online and do different things for us. But what happens if we take Peter as our prototype change actor, the one that we cannot reach through our futile and flawed forms of communication and interaction, either in the cultural spaces or in the digital technologies that we have around us? All right, so what did I want to do through all these different stories? I want to shift the focus of our conversation when talking about the role of cultural organizations, products, and practices in the age of the internet. Instead of the instrumental relationship about distribution, access, amplification, circulation, etc., I'm arguing that there is a more sinister interplay of power and protocol of algorithms and actors, of networks and performances that needs to be unpacked in order to think about the political futures and social structures of the entwining of culture and the internet. I'm proposing then that we concentrate um, only on this, that, that when we concentrate only on the spectacle, oh, that when we concentrate only on the spectacle imperative of change, we forget to look at the larger nexus of technological design interface intentions, and massive infrastructure of policing that exclude and discriminate against several groups of people who remain invisible in the circuits of change making. And I want to conclude by suggesting that when talking of infrastructure, actions, um, agents, and intentions, we need to focus not on how things happen, but who's allowed to participate, and the kind of policing and penalizing that are set into place as well as the new imaginations that are beyond the scale and reach uh, and concentrate on true understandings of participation and inclusion. And in the end, I want to perhaps imagine that the actors of change are not just people marching on streets or explicitly engaging in political discussions, 
but that my grandmother, who produces histories of things that were not there, and my godson, who performs his life as if he was history in the making, are both the new kind of performative actors whose interventions have critical implications for the digital futures we want to build and perform. Thank you. Nishat, thank you very much for your enlightening talk. And I would just, uh, I think, <clears throat> move over immediately and first ask uh, in our audience if we can take immediately one or two questions. Back there is Annika to just bring the mic. So, it's your turn. Hmm, okay. Then I'll let you rest uh, for a second and maybe start out by, by asking uh, Nishant, so if you propose, let's say, if the proposal is the sinister, yeah, and also the orgiastic and the perverted, uh, if we go back to the beginning of your lecture uh, regarding Macaulay's thoughts of putting spaces of security in between, let's say, the agents of, 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 of possible orgasms, yeah, isn't that possible to translate that into, let's say, a modern neoliberal uh, working space as we find it here, for example, next door at Zalando, means uh, are we not talking about the same kind of booth, of you know, distance and of, of control? Is that something, is that some message that's being brought to us through the ages? And is our gentrified approach, let's say, to fight this in the political arena, is that enough or do we need more sinister approach through the internet? Thank you, that's such a great question. But I think that's exactly one of the reasons why I want to start the history of the internet in 1835. That it was, it was so obvious when the colonial encounters were happening across the large part of the world that technologies and their mediation with cultural products was not this benign, aesthetic, let's be happy kind of a phenomenon, right? That it wasn't merely about what is the ideal form that is going to be produced or how the people are going to be brought onto the streets to perform certain kinds of actions. But there was a very clear idea that through the cultural economy which was being set into place at that time, only certain kinds of people will be allowed to be activated as agents. What happens with the digital especially is that we are given this very flattened idea of a network, right? So if you look at the physical computation of a network, uh, the primary hypothesis that's produced for you is that in the network there are no hierarchies because all nodes are born equal. And then without a sense of irony, they say, and some nodes are born more equal than the other because some nodes become hubs, right? Because more information traffic is going to flow through. But what happens is that this networked snapshot of our society allows us to stop thinking about the constantly, the, the constantly degenerating hubs or nodes within a network. That in order for something to become a node, an incredible amount of infrastructure needs to come into play. This infrastructure has logic which is not merely about usage, access, uh, electricity interface design, but it has very clear implications of who can and cannot use that infrastructure to even become a part of the network. So the network in itself is a sinister thing. The minute that we have bought into the network as the default metaphor by which we are going to explain the world around us, what we have now said is that we're going to narrowly focus only on those actors who can afford to be a node on the network. Right? And we're no longer looking at the people who cannot even be imagined as possibly belonging to that network. And so when you look at a whole range of things, then when you look at protocols, for example, um, how many people are on Facebook? Quite a substantially few, right? And you can do anything that you want on Facebook, right? Because it's your personal profile, it's your close set of networks. Uh, there's a range of things that you can uh, do in terms of status updates, the pictures that you put as long as they're not violating a terms of service or a, or a legal contract. How many people have tried to change the color of their Facebook walls? Because it's hideous, right? It's like one of the most ugliest form of aesthetic there is, the blue and white wall. How many people were successful in changing their design? 
So this is this is where the sinister stuff. Yeah, but you all you could do was like change it on your machine, right? Like you could basically install a grease monkey script or something, and then it would change it into a, a a pink and a white design or some sort of a skin that you like of a, of a I don't know an actress that you prefer or something. So this is where the sinisterness is. It's not really in what is obvious. When you, when you fight with Facebook about saying, what about my privacy? Facebook doesn't give a rat's ass, right? Because that's the thing that's easiest to kind of modify. So if you look at like a history of activism about how privacy regulations on Facebook have changed, what you have is essentially Facebook modifying its terms of service every six months. What you cannot question with, with Facebook is the very form of Facebook about who gets to be online right now. And it gets even more strange now with Facebook starting something called internet.org. I don't know if that's familiar in Germany. Uh, but in a large part of the world, Facebook's basically decided that by 2020, they want the entire population to be online for free. And so they've started a foundation called internet.org, which is providing free internet access to people with mobile phones in developing countries. Right? So if you go to India, for example, the internet.org is huge because it's tied up with one of the largest internet service providers and basically says we will give you free access to the internet. There are only two conditions. Free access to the internet means that you only visit sites that we decide are important for you. Yeah? So there's a list of 36 sites which are important for uh, the Indian poor person. To, so it's poor person's internet, so to speak. And anything else that you want uh, requires now value-added services. It's basically going against the principles of net neutrality, for instance. right? Um, and the second thing that you have to do is that in order to avail of all those services, you need to create a Facebook account. Like, simple. It's like so simple. All you need to do is create a Facebook account, and then you have it. So you want to kind of put Macaulay and Facebook at the same level. Yeah? That Facebook is constantly monitoring and creating different kinds of protocols about the exact distances which will happen between the two nodes. The kind of proximity principle, and this is always fascinating, saying, who is your best friend on Facebook? Facebook actually uses the same language that Macaulay uses, which is about distance. Right? Things which are close to you are your best friends, whereas things which are removed from you are not. Um, and one of the most interesting questions that you always want to ask is on Facebook, I should stop demonizing them so much. Um, but it's, it's such a great example. Um, but one of the most interesting things about Facebook is that if all of you are on Facebook or any social media, if I ask you right now to name the three closest people that you have the most interaction with, will you be able to name them? Yeah? You are wrong. The thing that you talk to most on Facebook is Facebook. Right? You don't talk to anybody else. I mean, just look at your friend list. You have 1,000 friends, you have 30 likes that the thing that actually listens to you, like, Dolph, like, like Peter the Dolphin, is Facebook. Facebook is your stalker. <laughs> there is an algorithm that is sitting and gets excited every time you post something, and it listens more intently than your mother, your shrink, or your partner to everything that you have to say, and it never forgets. Right? So you want to start thinking about these new kinds of mechanisms which are so made invisible in the very transparent aesthetic of the digital turn that we don't even pay attention to these kinds of phenomena. And so for me, the internet needs to be understood through maybe different kinds of histories and looking at the history of the user as well in a very, very different way rather than just being you know, here and now and everything starts in the 1960s or something. Yes, please. Well, I don't have a question, but I want to add to that because um, when we think of uh, uh, that, it's not only internet.org, uh, which ha is actually, I, I think, very bad because it uses the word internet to sell Facebook, but uh, it's also uh, the rest of the, in, like in India, if you, uh, it's a social question, you know, if you have uh, 25 rupees, you can go to Facebook. You, know, you have providers, online providers, access providers. Uh, if you have le less money, you get Facebook. If you pay 75 rupees, you get so the rest of the internet also. So it's not only the internet.org for Facebook, which is also not good, but it's, it's uh, the political, the legal question, the, the word for that is net neutrality or net neutralität. Which, but I, I think that is, as we are here for theater and, and net, the, the other important question here is, it's not net neutrality and all the legal questions, is what is public space, what is öffentlicher Raum in the internet? And it always was a question of how privacy is important. I mean, 
very important. But publicness is also important because publicness is where we happen as a society. And if the public sphere in the internet becomes controlled or just even organized, controlled is a very hard word, but organized by a commercial player or by a, a law which allows, like in, in Germany, for example, if you are with the telecom and you have this Spotify deal, you, Spotify, the data you use for Spotify is for free. That means you prefer Spotify to other uh, music providers, which is already a, a violation of net neutrality, but it's also giving you, taking you away culture, it's taking you away publicness. And mm -hmm. I think that is something, uh, the legal stuff is important and we have to fight for that, but as theater people or cultural people, we have to think about more about the public space on the, on what is happening online with that. Uh, I, I think I that's, a, I know that's, that's a wonderful addition. And in fact, I'll make a very small point about it, but just because you're provoking it now, uh, that it's not a legal fight. It never was a legal fight. Uh, it's actually a cultural fight, yeah? It's a cultural fight because we must remember that the internet was never meant to be free, accessible, and inclusive. It was built as a system of hiding and of fighting and of basically figuring out what are the best ways so that missiles can kill the most number of people, right? It's only when Tim Berners-Lee writes the famous Worldwide Manifesto that we start infusing all these cultural ideas of inclusion, participation, collaboration, and so on. It is actually against the nature of the physical infrastructure to be free and open. Yeah? And when we kind of go to the internet and we take it at face value, we are not able to look at the incredible amount of mediation that happens at different kinds of intermediary levels. Right? So it is, it, is, it is not just Facebook, it's not just your internet service provider, it's not just your telecommunication, it's also your government. And in many ways, it's also all of us who subscribe to and use these data services without giving it any particular thought. But what concerns me most when it comes to the kind of coming together of the cultural production sphere and the internet is that we automatically think that the only thing that the internet needs to be worried about is in terms of reaching new kinds of audiences, activating people in a certain way. It would be a fairly horrifying thing if theater practitioners once decide that the only way people can come to theater is if they have a Facebook account by which they're going to be able to buy their tickets, right? That when you blindly build blueprints, and this will happen to you, this will, this will happen when uh, people from McKinsey will come to you and say, we will build a blueprint of how to reach the most wide audience that you possibly can imagine, but what they will do is in the process, normativize what is the kind of audience that you are making your cultural products available to you. Right? It is literally squatting upon the commons and then enclosing it to make it into a private space of a certain kind. And, and that's where the sinister impulse is. That we buy into the internet way too easily and pretend that it has no politics involved in deciding who and how and when things are going to happen. And then that, that, that friction needs to be perhaps unpacked in some ways. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So, um your grandmother is an agent of change then, and how, speaking of hope, <laughs> of counter actions, how much do you give to these agents of change? So if I, I'm almost sure my grandmother's not watching this and I'm happy about it. Um, <laughs> but, but I think that the reason why I'm kind of pushing for my grandmother to be recognized as an agent of change is that there is a lot of instrumental relationship that we have with the digital technology, which is only about a teleological function, right? It is used to achieve a certain kind of a thing, and then it's over. The minute you fall into that trap of identifying the agent of change as merely somebody who can perform an action, which is legible, which can be counted, which will have what I call a spectacle imperative. A YouTube video can be made of it, a tweet can be made of it, a website can be made of it, those are the only people who actually get recognized as agents of change. But the true agency is in actually appropriating new forms of production. So when my grandmother produces uh, photographic evidence of history which did not happen, right, or new kinds of narratives of materialities which cannot be empirically proven, or when people start performing their lives as if performance was the default, rather than performance as something that you do separately, which is what my godson does. These are new eruptions in change acting processes. 
that these are actions which will not be counted in the matrix of like buttons and shares and retweets and plus ones, but these are still actually ways by which people are subverting the logic of what the internet is supposed to do, right? So my grandmother's Facebook profile page is also interesting because she joins Facebook in 2010, uh, and it shows that she was born in whatever, 1928 or something, right? Um, and now she has this really extraordinarily modern digital pictures which she's trying to tag as happened in 1936 because that's where her memory says it's located. And Facebook's not allowing her to do that. <laughs> yeah? And she's really frustrated with it. She says, I want this happened way back in my past. This is not a picture of 2015, but it's not going to allow you that negotiation. The minute you look at the ways in which these negotiations of affect happen, the ways by which affect becomes um, a platform from which the pervert can become an activist or a dolphin can become the new kind of a reader, you're thinking about a different process of change, which is not about trying to rehabilitate somebody or convert them into the actors that we can recognize, but recognize their actions as the beginning point of change-making processes. And maybe there is a different logic which needs to be invoked in that space. Anisha, unfortunately, yeah. I'm the bad boy who has to, who has to break it. And first of all, thank you so much for those enlightening thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you.